Thank you, Mike, and good afternoon. We've seen some very interesting high technology presentations today. Uh, so if you will indulge me, I'd like to start with some facts. The fact is that since the age of 10 gig, or even earlier, the market for short reach optics has been dominated by Vixel-based multi-mode links. It has been dominant, it is dominant today, and it will remain so for the near future. In calendar year 2024, for the AIML applications, the single largest 800 gig transceiver module to ship will be multi-mode. Now this morning there was some discussion about is that the end at 100 gig per lane, and I like to lay those fears to rest by saying there will be a 200 gig pixel. So it is not the end of the road. Why is this? Frankly, because short reach and multi-mode are just made for each other. You start with any set of requirements for a short reach application, cost, power, production friendliness, yields. And you make a list of all the requirements versus all the features of a Vixel-based multi-mode link, and you see an excellent match between the two. And that's why the market has voted with their wallet. The Vixel beam is small and circular. Therefore, the launch optics is simpler. It launches into a large fiber, therefore the tolerances are large. It reduces the cost associated with the yield loss because you can connect more of them in a day. It has low threshold current, so it produces sufficient power at low current, which reduces power. This allows you to build things that are smaller and more compact, and so on. <clears throat> In other words, made for each other. There is one subtle point, and the slide is busy, but I'll try and stay with the simple point. And it's the point about flexibility and margin. If you, if you have a technology that has over many years shipped tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of parts, and it has passed through the rigorous scrutiny of several IEEE standards, you develop a sense of where in the link to squeeze for margin and where in the link to allocate margin. I'll illustrate this with uh, an 800 gig eight lane transceiver module, which is being standardized by IEEE right now. It's a multi-mode uh, spec. Notice the power budget. The power budget is more than six dB. And yet, the actual channel insertion loss for that link is barely 2 dB, less than 2 dB. This allows us to allocate almost 4 dB, 4.5, 4.4 dB, to TDAC, the eye closure penalty. What does that do? What it does is that it lets you use components that are not severely constrained in bandwidth and noise specifications. That's just another way of saying lower cost. Take another example. See the transmit optical output power requirement. Uh, it's about a half a milliwatt, easy to do. And yet, if you happen to have a transmitter that has more noise or lower bandwidth, and somehow the eye closes more, that's the x-axis here, then you get to make up for it with throwing a little more power at it. So if you throw one milliwatt at it, you can have high eye closure. Flexibility, margin, by design. This has been the formula of success of multimode links. What improves cost? Volume, volume, volume. Experience, volume that builds on each other. And volume requires production margin by design, as we saw. 
So for example, as we take this pluggable transceiver module and bring it to the co-packaged optics world, as we soon will have to, notice that in order to maintain compliance with IEEE specs at TP2 and TP3, you're going to need to allocate some extra loss here and here inside the box because of the fiber harness and strain relief mechanism and so on. Because, as we saw in the previous two slides, multimode links are comfortably designed, they can absorb these extra loss and they can continue to produce a cost-effective solution. We asked ourselves, what can we build and how low a power envelope can we push? So IBM and then Finisar, now Coherent, uh, got together and under the sponsorship of US ARPA-E, the Department of Energy, did the first phase of the project, which is now complete. It's called Motion, Motion Phase One. It's a research project. It is not an IEEE compliant production shippable part yet, but the goal was to push the boundary of the, of the performance. And I'm pleased to say that this solution, which is built, tested, and demonstrated at uh, OFC earlier this year, has achieved four picojoules per bit. Let me be clear, that's four picojoules per bit, including lasers. There are no external lasers. There are no polarization maintaining fibers. The lasers are on board. Moving on to phase two. Phase two, which is in progress right now, is aiming for 3.2 terabits. So it will be 16 fibers, two wavelengths per fiber, and each wavelength will achieve 100, 100 gig per, per, per wavelength. So you have a 3.2 tera system. This is the block diagram. The objective is to achieve less than three picojoules per bit. And all indications are that we are on track to achieve that on schedule within budget. The obligatory table that Michael asked us to build. Well, I won't read everything, but I'll just highlight a couple of things. So it's capable of n times 3.2 tera, where n can be the number that depends on the system design. The electrical interface is USR, ultra short reach. Um, it's unretined, and this one um, supports KP4FAC. The 3.2 tera system, three picojoules per bit, no external light source, no PM fiber, KP4-FEC, and just because we're guessing 2027 onwards, I put in 25 cents per gigabit because th those are part of the public statements we have made. But as many speakers have said before, it's time to move beyond this dollar per gig and think about a total solution. And I think uh, you, sir, made a very good point about that. that when you're in the terabit regime, those pennies are almost an irrelevant discussion. When you have an onboard laser, it's a perfectly re reasonable engineering question to ask, how do we tackle reliability? Well, so if you have cold sparing in a Vixel, and because the incremental cost of adding a Vixel as a cold spare is low compared to the total cost of the transceiver system, it makes sense to put 100% one-to-one -one cold sparing. That is, the primary Vixel continues and when it fails, if it fails, the secondary Vixel, the backup Vixel takes over. It's like a parent-child model. And so you're asking, what's the combined life of the parent-child combination? And it dramatically improves reliability. And it's fast. You can switch the laser in less than 100 nanoseconds. So not just reliability, but perhaps you want to consider some clever system aspects. Maybe there are two senders, and one sender is connected to a receiver, and you can switch to a second sender because you can switch fast enough, and everything is on place and on board. 
uh, it's an interesting opportunity for us to jointly look at what system controls we should give this CPO solution uh, to achieve our objectives. In conclusion, I think Vixel-based multi-mode CPO is an excellent fit and deserves our serious consideration as we carry this work forward. Proven track record, encouraging results from the, from the research projects, low power consumption, low cost, production friendly, and then removing the weakness of the reliability of an onboard laser with a one-to-one -one cold sparing. Thank you. People are queuing for questions. Uh, hi, hi, Virpal. Uh, actually, you, you mentioned that this is on time, but, but if you look at your block diagram, this is read time because the back end is a USR. So that's, that's your retimer because your back end is actually a USR. You have a low power, so you may want to correct that on your slide. It's actually somewhere in the middle. It does not read time, but use, it uses clock to detect. So it, it, it wasn't clear which way we put this in the table, uh -huh. but we can discuss this offline. Yeah, but because I think it's, I would say that's a reason. Thank you. Well, to me, retimed is the signal that comes out is a fresh signal, but it isn't. Well, no, because usually it's usually recovered, because this is based on recovered from USR. For detection, but not for recovery of the clock. So, so you're forward in the clock? I'll, I'll put you in touch with the Thank guy you. who can answer this. Okay. I know you'd be disappointed if I didn't ask a question. <laughs> Could you go to your requirements thing? Requirements. Uh, I think it was like close to the end. Oh. The, the, for the CPO requirements. This one. Yeah, so I'm looking at the NOFEC or PREFEC BER of 180 to minus 9, and that's a very tall order for 112 gig PAM4. Vixels. Yes. Uh, how, how confident are you of that? It's a research project, and the research team is reporting these results. I'm sure that in a production environment, we will probably use a slightly degraded spec, um, but um, I, I can put you in touch with the guy who uh, can answer that. No, it's my advice to you. Watch that one. <laughs> Chris, if you were an employee, I would tell you more. <laughs> Being a consultant is not good enough. Not good enough, sorry. Can you explain how the cold sparing works when you switch to the additional pixel? This one. So it's either polarization multiplexed or wavelength multiplexed. And we initially had to decide whether we should rely on the system or just do our own internal detection. For now, we're going with internal detection, a tap and, and, and a way to detect power. And as soon as it falls below a threshold, you switch. But we would love for this community to support us with a system level solution. So one, we don't have to do that. And two, probably it achieves a larger system goal. So both Vixels, the spare and the primary, are coupled into the fiber, but one is off. Correct. And think of a Y or a V-shape uh, connection. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.